Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! Hi, folks. Welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans where we are up to cosmic shenanigans uh for 2020. It's our first episode of the new year. I'm very excited. And this episode, we're going to tackle a movie which for a long time I debated was not cosmic horror. I felt that this movie fell squarely into the realm of demons and demonic possession as opposed to cosmic horror. However, you know, I, I've reconsidered. I, I've given it some thought. And I know that we have covered in a number of episodes the occasional modern cosmic horror stance that angels and demons are actually lesser gods and goddesses, that they're part of a pantheon whose specific motivations are alien to us and who often appear indifferent to humanity or flat out hostile to them. Despite demonic possession stories' frequent focus on the downfall and destruction of the individual, which would make it almost opposite cosmic horror, um, I can see where a case can be made that these lesser gods, in displaying power through control of a human body, are actually amplifying the idea that humanity as a whole, individually or collectively, is powerless against forces in the universe greater than itself. If one adds further to that, the notion that hell is simply another dimension or plane of existence to which otherwise entities oblivious of our presence might discover humanity and turn an eye toward its destruction, particularly if that hell dimension is in some part of dark and starless space beyond our known solar system or even our known universe, then we do have cosmic horror. And what I find interesting in this episode that we're going to talk about are the interesting parallels between hell and Lovecraft's concept of the deep dark spaces where Azathoth and the the outer gods actually live. Now, such is the premise, the basic premise, of the 1997 science fiction horror classic Event Horizon. It was written by Philip Eisner, directed by Paul Anderson, and stars Lawrence Fishburne, Sam Neill, Kathleen, Kathleen Quinlan, Jolie Richardson, Richard T. Jones, Jack Noseworthy, and Jason Isaacs. Now, the basic plot, I'm going to give you the basic plot here so that we can, we can look at its elements, uh, specifically in relation to cosmic horror. In the year 2040, uh, essentially this, this new kind of spaceship is created. And I apologize to people who are diehard science fiction fans or even diehard science fans because a lot of what I'm going to talk about because I love science but I don't understand it except if it's explained to me in terms of a five-year-old uh, a lot of this is going to sound oversimplified and I apologize for that however uh, this new kind of ship that is built for interstellar travel has been developed it's got a new kind of drive a gravitational drive um, which was developed by Sam Neill's character Dr. Weir and in the year 2040, it goes out past Neptune and it disappears. Seven years later, in 2047, it reappears somewhere between Neptune and Pluto. And a crew, I want to say they're, they're a salvage crew, but that may not be 100% accurate. But the salvage crew has been hired to go out and retrieve what's left of the event horizon and find out what happened to it one and as the creator the designer of this ship sam neill's character is along for the ride what they discover along the way is that this ship has been beyond the limits of known space and time we're going to come back and and that turns out to be bad we're going to come back to that one of the elements that this movie definitely has and definitely plays with in terms of cosmic horror is the notion of insanity. Uh, the, 
clearly we have we have Dr. Weir. He's not gotten over the suicide of his wife, and he hallucinates her presence even before he enters the event horizon. Okay. Um he is clearly not over this, and it informs a lot of his personality in, in very subtle ways, which I find fascinating. It is also, I think, the uh, when when last week we talked about how Naira Lahotep would look for an in to break your mind, uh, a, a thing that might have already been there, a weakness, uh, a hole in the armor, if you will, that could be exploited in order to break your mind and, and you know, flip you over to the insanity and chaos side. That's pretty much what, what's happening here. Dr. Weir, as smart as he is and as scientifically minded as he is, he is clearly not uh, of the, you know, of any belief in the supernatural or tends to go out of his way to ignore it, um, even when evidence presents itself. Um, he is, you know, he's like, he's, he's the voice for science, but he has that, that predis predisposition to be influenced by whatever, you know, the force is on the event horizon, because he already feels incredibly guilty and incredibly depressed about the death of his wife. We also have essentially what happens is that where the event horizon went for seven years, it brought back a life force. If we could, the life force is not categorized consistently as an entity in the movie. It's categorized as a life force. Um, but for the sake of ease, if we were to think of it as a singular entity, a sentient type of entity, uh, then the entity has the ability to read the intimate, the most intimate experiences and innermost thoughts and fears of the crew members on the ship. And it uses these, these experiences against these individuals by assimilating essentially a kind of madness, hallucinatory things, which are a step beyond hallucination because they actually have physical uh, sensory components. Uh, one character, uh, Miller, who is the captain of the ship, Lawrence Fishburne's character, um, had to leave one of his old crew members who had caught on fire in zero gravity. Um, when this apparition appears to him, he can feel the heat of the fire. So it's things like that where, where there's a, a sense, a, a, an intermingling in this movie, a lot of reality and fantasy and the blurring of the lines between the two of them, which is very common in cosmic horror. Also, the blurring of the lines between insanity and sanity, and at what point people cross over from one to the other, which is also uh, a very prominent feature in a lot of cosmic horror. We also have the very premise of a device that is essentially a black hole. Now, let me explain a little bit about black holes. I know in the past I have compared uh, Lovecraft's most powerful entities, his outer gods, the elder gods like Azathoth, uh, to a black hole because there is a certain sense that um, a black hole is not really aware of our existence and it doesn't care, uh, that it only affects things that come within its uh, gravitational pull and that it will destroy those things inevitably. And I looked this up, believe me, I looked up ways to survive a black hole. And no matter what scientific theory you go with that uh, you know, including all of the paradoxes and, uh, issues with every scientific theory I could find about black holes. In every case, there is no way to survive it. Um, there are some theories that would allow you to survive it a little bit longer. Uh, but there, there are a number of things happening with a black hole. It is a force of the universe which is indifferent to us and utterly destructive. And to me, I think that's a pretty good, I think a lot of the the elder gods, the outer gods that Lovecraft came up with, are parallels to that kind of force of nature, which is indifferent, and yet utterly destructive once we are within its pull. Okay? The term event horizon, 
for those who are scientifically inclined, I looked up and again, I had to have it. I had to look up a number of sources to have it explained to me so that it was something that I could kind of grasp. So not to bog down with too much scientific detail. An event horizon is something that is described as the point at which an observer is no longer affected by the thing that the person is observing. And what that basically means is that it, it, it was, if you believe that space and time are fixed structurally, that they are things that exist and that they exist, they can only function a certain way. An event horizon would be the point that you get to at the black hole where time seems to slow down so that you're always getting closer and closer, but never actually entering a black hole, or that's how it appears on the outside. Um, in a symbolic way, the event horizon is where time and space break down, where what we understand psychologically and scientifically about time and space ceases to exist. And that one of the concepts of this event horizon is that the part of space that is the void, the part of space beyond the edges of our universe is forever out of our reach because uh, the universe is expanding and it's expanding faster than we could ever travel. So basically what you have then in this event horizon ship is a thing capable of breaking time and space as we know it to reach places, other dimensions, other locations that we should never, based on the science that gives our lives strength and comfort, uh, would allow us to do. And so I think that's kind of an interesting aspect of the title here. That And, and something which really does sort of tie it to cosmic horror in a way that I had never thought about. Um, furthermore, it is in the Event Horizon ship... Okay, a core, they call it a core, uh, which is the, the engine, I guess. And it basically is a black hole. They cre recreated a black hole, which is capable of bending space and time. So this is, again, integrating supernatural with science, which is something Lovecraft always did, because Lovecraft was an avowed atheist and uh, tried to give all of his creatures some scientific basis. As the characters mention in the movie, this core creates a dimensional gateway, which you kind of can't get more cosmic horror than that. Almost anything that enters our world enters through some kind of gateway, some kind of dimensional gateway. And as Dr. Weir points out, what it does, if you, if you imagine a piece of paper, right, and you put a point A on one end and a point B on the other one end and you fold it in half, point A and B coexist in the same space and time which is a, you know, a break from how we understand science. And as he also points out later in the movie, the ship has been beyond the boundaries of our universe, beyond scientific reality. And that, to me, is a, a very strong premise of, of cosmic horror, that humanity is coming in contact with things that are not just beyond our scientific understanding, but beyond our scientific reality, beyond the boundaries of the universe, which as children were essentially thought, you know, taught to think is, is the, the encompassing of everything, everything that is. Uh, and to find out that there is more than everything that is, is, is kind of terrifying. We have also, uh, the, the only name that is ever applied to this entity which exists on the co on the event horizon this this cosmic life force okay is the dark it's only called that once um so i mean you know if it can be called a name i guess it is known as the dark and there is a lot of uh visual play between light and dark in the movie we first have the dark of lim limitless space because this takes place, you know, in outer space. Uh, we have the light of explosions. We have lights all over both ships flickering on and off. And if you notice when you go back and watch the movie, uh, lights almost always flicker between light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, before something is about to happen, before the worst of things 
is about to happen. Um, it happens a lot before the deaths of characters or before uh, some horrific hallucination that they see where you either have a blazing up of light or the sudden absence of it, the dark, or you know, like I said, a back and forth between them. Um, when light and dark are juxtaposed, it's like a battle between reality and the distorted reality is being waged, which goes back to the idea of a black hole. Uh, scientists used to believe that black holes swallowed light. There's also a theory that they bend light, but either way, it amounts to the same idea that a black hole appears to swallow up all light and that light is not fast enough to travel away from it. In the same token, the event horizon is swallowing souls and most souls are not fast enough to escape that kind of gravitational pull. When the ship feels threatened, when the entity on the ship feels threatened, it's almost like its first communication is with light and dark. One of the characters theorizes that what it's doing is a defense mechanism, that it, it feels threatened, so it is eliminating the threat. Uh, and a lot of times you can tell when the ship is getting angry because the lights flicker on and off or things, you know, things like that happen. Um, when the characters are essentially devoured by this entity, their eyes turn all black. Um, and we're going to come back to the, uh, the concept of eyes because that is a, that is a big theme in this movie. Um, but what I find interesting is that it's a reversal the, the, what they do with light and darkness is almost a reversal of what is usually done. Usually we think of light as safety and knowing, and we think, you know, like people say you're in the dark, it means you're ignorant of a situation, you don't understand what's going on. In this case, darkness is all the knowledge of hell. And light is the last opportunity that you have to sort of uh, reclaim some kind of uh, sanity, some kind of, you know, mental safety and so when the darkness swallows your light then uh it's basically it's gotten to you and and it, you, you can't escape that kind of gravitational pull uh, what we also have now i had mentioned before the the concept of eyes eyes in this movie and and i bring this up because in cosmic horror this is also something that that seems very common the idea of of knowledge and of seeing and uh, of sudden understanding of things that we weren't meant to know and a lot of lovecraft's work there uh the the main characters go out of their way to seek this knowledge in some cases especially in modern cosmic horror uh the knowledge is a result of some other thing that they're seeking. Uh, but it's inescapable. Once you know it, you can't unknow it. And this takes the form in this particular movie of eyes. In many of the characters in their downfall, their eyes are either clawed out or hollowed out in some way, or as I mentioned before, completely black. Uh, because it indicates that we shouldn't be seeing these things. We shouldn't be knowing these things. And yet they have a hold on us. Uh, what I think is interesting is that the, no this, this, the idea of knowledge that can't be unseen is a premise that appears both in cosmic horror and in the Judeo-Christian versions of hell and possibly in other religious. I, I mean, I can't speak with authority to that, but I believe that other versions of a hell type place uh use the same concept that the, the the real depictions of hell are not just like you know a pit of fire but this idea that um it's an endless loop of something you can't escape some torment that is forever foisted on you uh we have the idea that adam and eve ate the fruit from the forbidden tree and then all of a sudden they could see that they knew everything and that the knowledge was the, the, their downfall, that it was ultimately too much for them. Um, in hell, it would be that, that you would suddenly understand all the things that you were blissfully and thankfully unaware of. And as one of the characters says, that this dark, it shows you things, horrible things. And when they ask you who, what is showing you this? He says, the dark inside me from the other place. Um, Dr. Weir explains that the event horizon 
tore a hole in our universe, a gateway to another dimension, a dimension of pure chaos, pure evil. So what we have is the outpouring of chaos, like Nyarlathotep's, you know, ultimate goal, uh, a dimension of that that is chaos itself, that is Azathoth, you know, essentially, uh, and that this ship tore open that dimensional gateway and allowed us access to things that we never should have had access to. Uh, finally, we have, and this is, this is one of those, one of those, uh, less frequently recognized aspects of cosmic horror. But, uh, the longer I do this show, the more I realize that this comes up, uh, far more frequently, I think, than most people think. Because Lovecraft tended to want to leave stuff to the imagination, um, that he wanted to emphasize the idea of things being too alien to describe. Uh, and also because I think that there was a certain, and this might have been a personality thing, or the time when he wrote this, he glossed over uh, the details of a lot of horrific things that he did imply. I mean, his stories implied rape, they implied orgies, they implied a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of deviance and, and a lot of, of horror, a lot of violence. Uh, what we have here, a lot of body horror, a lot, which is, which is not something that is normally associated with cosmic horror. Normally, uh, graphic violence is associated with extreme horror, splatterpunk. It's not usually associated with cosmic horror, but it is there. And I think modern cosmic horror has decided to show you that which cannot be shown. You know, uh, we do, uh, you know, in, in this movie, we don't ever see the entity, uh, that is the dark, except in the form of the hallucinations that it shows the people that it is targeting. Um, so there is that, there is the element that maybe we are not capable of seeing whatever this thing is in whatever dimensional form it exists in. But we do see this concept of body horror versus mental torment. There's a point where the characters discover a log, a ship's log, which only very briefly and in, in flashes, almost as if it was Lovecraft doing this, um, it shows you little brief flashes of torture and orgies and um vivisections and uh you know people being cut open and organs spilling out people cannibalism people eating each other and they show you just enough for your brain to register something horrible and then they move on it is a very short clip it is actually strangely enough in when the, in the year that this came out the edited version of this movie does not show you the video for more than a second. The unedited version shows you several seconds of this. And by today's standards, it's fairly tame as far as a horror movie goes. But I mean, it was very shocking at the time. I mean, there, there were, there were things there that they didn't often show in any kind of mainstream horror movie. And it was body horror. It was people wrapped in barbed wire. It was people, you know, on spears. It was, uh, all kinds of, all kinds of horrific things that you're only shown for a brief second. But cosmic horror, one of the, uh, thematic aspects of cosmic horror is that, uh, the body is, we tend to think because we experience our entire world in a, through the, through our senses. So physicality is important to us. Okay. One of our biological drives is sex and physical intimacy. Um, we eat, we drink, we see, we hear, we feel, we taste. So one of the horrors, one of the things that drives horror is the idea of pain or mutilation or some type of maiming of the physical body. Cosmic horror almost embraces that uh, for different reasons than extreme horror does, uh, but it embraces it in a way that says that uh, your not only is your life meaningless, not only is your mind uh a toy to be broken, but your body's even less that. Your body is a is is a prison. It is a uh, uh basically it's just clay to be smushed into different directions and different. It, it, the the respect for the physicality of humanity 
is nil in cosmic horror because most entities to them physicality is like uh, the the uh characteristic of of the lowest kind of life form and it's really the mind the limitless imagination the limitless potential of uh human thought and feeling and imagination which is of more interest to them and that is what it targets that is what the entity in the event horizon targets it's more the mind um so that mutilated bodies is you know it's just par for the course i mean um we see bodily torture and mutilation in the log but we also see uh and this I didn't notice. I mean, I've seen Event Horizon several times, and I've never noticed this. But if you looked at uh, toward the end of the movie at Weir, once he has been essentially devoured by this darkness and has given over to it, there is a scene where he confronts Miller um, in the core, or like in the core room of the ship, and he has cuts all over him. And if you look at his face, it looks like basically somebody just took a razor and just you know gave him a thousand little cuts all over his face. If you look at his back, though, and this is what I had never noticed, those cuts are not random. They are actually in shapes. They actually look like runes. And that is also a cosmic horror element, this idea that um, there is as much magic in the natural, there's as much supernatural in the natural as there is scientific. Uh, this idea that he has been marked, but he has been marked with the runes of a dimension that still understands the power of magic, the power of dark magic. And I thought that was kind of fascinating. And, and part of the body horror of this is that he is, he is no longer in control of his mind or his body, but that he is connected now to the ship and, uh, and that he's connected in a very cosmic, traditionally cosmic horror sort of way with these markings and runes. So that is Event Horizon. I will admit now that I stand corrected that a case can be made for this to be, uh, I mean, you could say that this is uh, essentially a, a haunted house story. You could say it's a demonic possession story. And both of those things would be right. But a case can be made for it being a cosmic horror story as well. And... I, I think that it's, it's definitely an, a, an interesting addition to, uh, the cosmic horror canon that, um, I probably should have seen sooner, but I'm glad, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about it. I think it's, it's a great movie and it really does, I think, start to bridge that gap in the nineties between, uh, slasher movies of the eighties and, perhaps more philosophical uh psychological things that uh that the 90s really sort of focused on. So if you enjoyed that, I'm so glad that you're you know you're back joining us for for episodes of Cosmic Shenanigans for 2020. Uh we are going to be covering all kinds of things this year, art, music, uh cosmic horror in the real world. Those episodes seem to be popular, so we're going to tackle a couple of those. And uh, I look forward to bringing you cosmic shenanigans from all over the universe in future episodes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can listen to past, present, and future episodes of Cosmic Shenanigans on a number of different platforms, Project Entertainment Network, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, although I think iTunes is Apple. Uh, I think it's Apple now. Uh, basically, any place where podcasts are broadcast, you can find us. Uh, you can also check out another show that I co-host, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, uh, available in the same places. You can check out Engineer Matt Wildeson's Grindcast, and also available places where podcasts are uh, available. And you can check out both of our books, which have cosmic horror goodness all over the place. Uh, and we look forward to bringing you more. So thanks for listening. See you next week. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, Project Entertainment Network presents The Mondo Method. An old man with a goatee teaches a younger guy with a beard how to write. 
Introducing first, he's the mentor and the greatest manager of all time, Mondo Guerrero. And from parts unknown, up and coming superstar, the Great Buddha. Okay, so maybe the names are really just Armand Rosamilia and Chuck Buddha, and maybe you'll learn something while they're at it. Wednesdays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.